Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We're hitting you up with the election of 1940. It's a big one. We're on the cusp of World War II. FDR, he don't care what George Washington says. He's going for the third term. -y. And we have Wendell Wilkie on the Republican side of the aisle, a dark horse candidate, really popular guy, going for the defeat of FDR. I think you know what happens, but we're gonna giddy up for the learning anyway and get started right now. Four hundred and forty-nine electoral votes for the third termer now, FDR. Only eighty-two electoral votes for Wendell. You can see, though, if we look at the thirty-six map, the Republicans were only picking up two states, Vermont and Maine, at that point. So Wendell has expanded the map for the Republicans. You can see that he's winning some of those northern central states, including Michigan, the industrial areas up there. So he's changing it slowly, but it's not enough. Fifty-five percent for popular vote FDR, forty-five percent for the Republicans, and um, like I said before, only ten. 10 states for the Republicans, 38 states for the Democrats. The big difference is that Wendell can't win those northern, northeastern cities like New York and Boston. So um, for Democrats, 60% in those cities for Democrats, only about 40% for Republicans. Republicans in all of those other areas in the Northeast are going to win, but it's not enough to trounce over those demographics that are happening in these growing cities. The Solid South is still the Solid South. We saw that break up a little bit in 1928 when Al Smith the Catholic ran, but now now it is again solidly with those Democrats. So that's pretty much the electoral map as you can see. Let's kind of put this election in context, what's going on in 1940, and then we'll look at the candidates, and then we'll look at closing up this lecture. <laughs> So looking back at 1940, you might think that everybody was all ready to go defeat the Nazis, but that's far from the case. Most of the country is non-interventionalist at best. A lot of the country are isolationist, groups like America First. Charles Lindbergh was a huge America First guy who's actually pro-German, but he's really trying to push the United States from joining World War II, and they see FDR as kind of, you know, getting ready to enter the war. And FDR promised at the 1940 election, he knew the pulse of the country, he said, I'm not going to send our boys onto foreign soil to fight a foreign war. So it's humongous, this feeling in the United States. We want it at all costs to avoid World War II. World War I is still in our memories. We still have that isolationist neutrality kind of thing going on in the United States bloodstream. So that's huge in this election. That's kind of overhanging everything. And the other thing that's overhanging everything is the concept that FDR is going for a third term. Um, it's kind of been thought of before that as ex facto law that this is kind of the rule that nobody runs for a third term. But of course, it's unwritten. Washington only suggested this. It's not written in law. It's not written in the Constitution. Yet, we don't have that 22nd Amendment. So FDR is going to use his power as president to push himself through and be that candidate. And looking back, most historians think that FDR just thought you know, he was the only guy who could win World War II for the United States, that he knew we were going into war, and he felt that any other candidate without the type of experience he had in terms of being commander-in-chief would falter. So he did it for what's best for the country. And of course, people that are against FDR said that's nonsense, that he did it because he was power-hungry and he liked being president. He just wanted to be president forever. So think of that context. Think about how that war is raging. And now let's take a look at the Republicans and the Democrats in the campaign. FDR didn't face huge competition in the nomination process. The only real competition came from his vice president, John Gardner, who was much more conservative than FDR. He had turned against the New Deal at that point. But FDR is going to handily be able to defeat him. And he chooses a huge liberal from the Midwest, Henry Wallace, to be his vice president. And that actually ended up being a little bit of some extra baggage. Henry Wallace had had a kind of weird personal life, dabblings with the New Age and with some Russian mystics and all of that jazz. So that was kind of something that was in that campaign. But it didn't become a huge, huge deal. Really, the huge thing that FDR has to deal with is this concept that, you know, why do you want to be king? Why are you going for this third term? And he just kept reassuring the American people that he was the one who was best qualified, that the job wasn't done yet, that we still had to protect America and continue this progressive New Deal concept. And for him, it worked. Most voters still blame the GOP for the Great Depression. It's only been a decade, so that's fresh in the 
minds of most Americans, so they're going to trust FDR. And FDR was very keen at pointing out that the Republican nominee, who we're going to look at in a second, was a huge businessman. So running on that concept, like in 36, that you can't trust the GOP, the Republicans with the economy, because look what they did. Look at the world, and we're in the verge of war, and I'm going to keep us out of it, and I'm the most experienced. That was FDR's pitch. And like I said before, it's a pitch that's going to be going right down the middle, and it's a strike. It's going to work, or is it a home run? You get the idea. Wasn't supposed to be Wendell Wilkie. Wendell Wilkie will be the nominee. He is a very successful businessman. He was actually a Democrat voting for FDR in the 1932 elections. He actually owned an electric power company. And when the TVA came out, which was supplying cheap federal government or state government power, he turned against the New Deal because you know he didn't like competing with government power. He saw a lot of problems with that. But it was supposed to either be the son of William Howard Taft, Robert Taft, the very conservative isolationist senator from Ohio or it was supposed to be Dewey, the crime-fighting New York City attorney, you know, politician who was going to clean up Washington. But both of these guys are non-interventionalist isolationists, and they really were splitting the delegates, and they couldn't figure out which one was going to win. And then enter Wendell Wilkie, who is kind of the compromise candidate. He's not pro-war, but he's certainly somebody who believes in aiding Great Britain. He's seen as the compromise candidate, the guy who is in the middle um, between these Republican primary opponents who, you know, want to stick their heads in the sand, and FDR, who, you know, re is ready to go to war. Elect Wendell. He's the smartest guy for the job. He'll keep us out of war, but he'll also make sure that our ally, Great Britain, will win the election. So he gets the nomination. And his campaign is really kind of fostered around, A, being opposed to wasteful spending, that the New Deal is great, but there's a lot of government bureaucracy around it. We need to cut back on spending and make sure that these government programs are run efficiently. But he's not so conservative that he's saying we need to dismantle Social Security or anything like that. And like I said before, he's not a non-interventionalist, but he's certainly somebody playing the card of, I'll keep us out of war, FDR won't, he wants to go to war. And that language got more coarse as the campaign went on. And his big, big issue is that America is ready for a change, that, you know, this is unconstitutional in concept, that FDR wants a third term, we need to stop him, and I'm the best guy for the job. And he was a very slick salesman. He was really good at talking with people. He's the best candidate the Republicans have yet to run against FDR, but it's not enough. It should be, you know, noteworthy to mention that there was one other guy who wanted to run for the nomination. Herbert Hoover, back from 32, he's back in 40, and the Republican Party was like, no, it's way too soon. We don't want to look at you. And Wendell got that nomination, like I said before. And he ran a stellar campaign. It's just not going to be enough with what's going on with World War II and still having the kind of, you know, faint aroma of the Great Depression and he being a businessman. Didn't work out. So there you go, guys. That's the 1940 election in a nutshell. FDR, he's knocked three down. He's got one more to go. We're going to get there. If you haven't subscribed to Hip Use History, you can do that by clicking that big red button right up there. That'll zip you through the lands of the internet to subscribe for fun and funky and free lectures. And if you haven't checked out the whole election playlist, we've done, I think, 25 at this point. We're working our way there. Not going in order all the time, but we're doing it. Click that box right there, and that'll zip you to that playlist. So thanks for watching, guys. I always say it where attention goes, energy flows. Giddy up for the learning, and we'll see you next time that you press my buttons.